Hey, welcome everybody. It's very late in certain parts of America. Where I'm at, it's 11 p.m. So pray by the grace and mercy of our God and save the Lord Jesus Christ. I won't be a distraction, a nuisance, annoyance to my neighbors that I can be Jesus Christ to them and not shame the Lord. <clears throat> now, for some of you, it's probably seven in the morning, probably afternoon, evening. But here in New York and Michigan, it's 2 a.m., folks, 2 a.m. For me, it's 11 p.m. So invite people. What's up, Tomas? God bless you, brother. I hope you're not going to sleep. I know it's 1 a.m. for you, but obviously you're up, huh? Do you work tomorrow? No, Real Me, it's not live. It's Memorex. Real Me is asking, is this live? No, Real Me, it's not. Uh, it's, it's actually fake you, and it's not live. It's Memorex. <laughs> oh, my goodness, dude. I love it, dude. Uh, he said, hey, is it real? Cause I'm, no, no, bro. Hey, fake you. This is the real me. This is the fake you. It's not live. It's Memorex. Now I'm dating myself, right? I'm dating myself. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys remember that uh, commercial? It's not live. It's Memorex. All right. Welcome. Invite people. Hopefully we'll get a good crowd, a large crowd for the glory of Jesus, a large crowd of people who are quality, not simply quantity, who want to learn and not debate. What's up, First Last? And our poor brother, First Last, it's two in the morning for this guy, man. And I said, if you can't make it, that's okay. I'll just wing it by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So welcome, everyone. Let's pray and ask the Lord to be glorified. Let's ask the Lord to bless. Let's ask the Lord Jesus to fill us for the glory of his name. We love you, Father. We love you, Bobby. We love you, Abba. <clears throat> we love you, Avino. Lord Jesus, we love you. Son of God, we love you. Beloved of the Father, the heart of the Father became flesh. We love you. The virgin-born Son of Mary, we love you, Lord Jesus. The Son of David, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Eternal Spirit of the Father, we love and adore you. Eternal Spirit of the Son, we worship you. We love you. We cling to you. We depend on you. Holy Spirit, I ask, as you blessed earlier, bless this session. <clears throat> Please, Holy Spirit, fill my throat, my lungs, my chest with life from your glorious, majestic presence. Strengthen my voice. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of all who are gathered to hear from you using imperfect <clears throat> human vessels to preach your perfect word by your power and strength for the glory of Jesus Christ. Sanctify my motives, not to do it for the praise of men, for fame or fortune. And constrain me, grant me power to exercise perfect self-constraint and control, not to shame the Lord Jesus, but to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to be unnecessarily offensive, please, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Empower me to recall scriptures perfectly and loosen my tongue. Save me from stammering and stuttering, Holy Spirit. Save me from error and bless them, Holy Spirit. Enlighten, illuminate them, Holy Spirit. Help us to plunge the depth of scripture, to bring out the meat of scripture, to feast on scripture and live it out by your power for the glory of Jesus. May the Lord Jesus increase in us and our loved ones, my daughters. May the Lord Jesus increase in them. Lord Jesus, increase in their lives and our lives and the lives of our loved ones. Their hearts, Lord Jesus, our hearts, your everlasting throne. Cover us by your blood, Son of God, the blood of the Lamb, and sanctify us for your glory, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> be magnified, Abba. Father, be glorified and magnified in union with your Son, the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and use me for that purpose. We, we depend on you, Abba. We love you. We depend on you and love you, Lord Jesus. We depend on you and love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Bless the Internet connection and bless the people and destroy attacks of Satan. And strengthen us for the glory of Jesus. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Wash me, Lord God, my King, Lord Jesus Christ, Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahweh, Rapha, Yahweh, Rapha, Yahweh, Rapha, Father, Son, and Spirit, and eat the flesh and drink the blood of my God and save the Lord Jesus Christ. Yahweh, Rapha, Father, Son, and Spirit. Sam H., I don't know what Sam H. is saying. He's saying probably from having to defend the faith for so long. What are you talking about, Sam H.? Jonathan, what's going on? You tell us. What's going on? We're waiting for you to tell us. All right. <clears throat> As you know, it's become my habit to get us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Well, Sam H., just to share with you, even very early on, all glory to the Holy Spirit. He gets all the glory and praise and honor and majesty. For everything good we do, we must give glory to the trying God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Even from very early on, and Tomas will be a witness. Tomas is here. 
<clears throat> Tomas will be a witness. Once I started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in a vacuum, scriptures from memory, and then I realized early on that was God's unique gifting. This was God's gift to me. The Holy Spirit grant me this gift early on, even when I first started in the faith. I was able to recall the scriptures, and that's the gift of the grace of the Holy Spirit. And I pray he perfects that gift to use it in holiness and purity to glorify Jesus and strengthen Christians. So it's not something that simply developed in time. From the moment I started preaching, this ability was there. It wasn't something I had to work on because it was the grace of the Holy Spirit who takes imperfect vessels and enables and empowers them to do wonders for the glory of Jesus Christ. So it's not something I earned or I deserved or I worked at. It was just the gift of his grace. And everyone, everyone, everyone has a gift. In fact, maybe more than one gift, several gifts given to you by the Holy Spirit according to his will to be used to glorify Jesus Christ, right? So hopefully, Sam H., you got, got that now, and you can give glory to the Holy Spirit, and that you're going to help me to help you and not get, go into tangents or pontificate, but listen and ask relevant questions for the glory of Christ. So everyone on board, first and last, you tired or you up? <clears throat> and by the way, let me just confirm that before we say the Lord's Prayer. Everything you have that's good, that's pleasing in the sight of God, is the gift of His grace. And your responsibility is to use that gift, walk in that gift, perfect that gift by the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit supplies you, perfecting it for the glory of Jesus and using it for the benefit of others. Let me show you that. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Okay, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Got hot here. I don't know why. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Okay. I'm getting old, man. I'm not young anymore. Read with me. And thank first and last for staying up late. Pray for his health. The Lord Jesus bless him with strong health and holiness and purity and provision and for his beloved mother and family in Jesus' name. Notice what Paul says by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, guys. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Watch here. For who makes you differ from, from another? What makes you different from someone else? And what do you have that you did not receive? Guys, you got to really meditate. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to focus and meditate and illuminate you. Because we want to know the scriptures and understand them and live them out for the glory of Christ. And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Let me explain what Paul is saying. Do you understand what Paul is saying here? Everything you have that distinguishes you and differentiates you from another Christian is a gift that the Holy Spirit gave you. You received it. You did not earn it. You were not born with it in the sense that it was given to you. It wasn't something that you <clears throat> acquired on your own, but it was given to you. Now, if it was given to you, that means it's not something you acquired, you deserve. It is grace of favor given to you. And if it's favor, why then do you use that gift to lord it over your brother and sister? Use that gift to get puffed up. <clears throat> over your brother and sister, looking down upon your brother and sister as if somehow you're superior to them because the gift given to you that you didn't deserve but was given it by grace. See what he's saying? In other words, he's saying be humble. Don't be so arrogant and puffed up because God gave you some gifts, gifts that are amazing because God is amazing. The giver is amazing, and he gives amazing gifts. And then you get puffed up and you think you're better than the next guy because of the gifts that you don't deserve but was given to you freely. That's his point, right? John 3, 27. John 3, 27. So let me show you that from Scripture. Thank you, Lord. Be glorified, Father. Be glorified, Lord Jesus. Be glorified, Holy Spirit. Strengthen my voice and give me the health I need to use it to glorify you in Jesus' name. John 3, 27. <clears throat> Watch here. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Did you catch it? A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. James 1, 17. James 1, 17. 
You boast in the Holy Spirit, Jonathan, and you brag about the God who is an amazing gift giver and a gracious giver of gifts. You don't boast in yourself, Jonathan, unless the Lord humbles you. <clears throat> James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, not from you. You didn't earn it. You didn't acquire it by your efforts, by your good looks, or by your wealth. Given to you from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He's unchangeable and immutable. You caught it? Is that clear now? Finally, let's look at a passage in reference to Israel, why God redeemed Israel, brought them out of bondage. Because they are better than the Egyptians and deserved it. Deuteronomy 8, verses 16 18. Deuteronomy 8, verses 16 18. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna? God fed you with manna in the wilderness, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. That's what you may say in your arrogant, wicked heart. My own power, my own might, the might of my hand, gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, Yehovah your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Is that clear now? Did it sink in by the grace of the Holy Spirit? Did it sink in? So does this leave any room for boasting? Does this leave any room for a person to be arrogant? May the Lord destroy my false sense of humility and my pride and arrogance and truly give me the grace and mercy to be humble and know and mean it from my heart. I am absolutely nothing without Jesus. I am what I am because of Jesus in those areas that are good and righteous and pleasing to Jesus. My sinfulness and perfection and weakness, my moral failures are from me, my fallen nature and or instigation of Satan, not from God. Anything good from me, Anything pleasing, delightful is from my God working in me effectually by the Spirit as he does in all of you, the members of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I remind myself and I remind every one of you, and I mean this from my heart. The Lord does not need me, David Wood, Nabil Qureshi. We need him, and it is his grace and mercy that he raises up Nabil Qureshi's, David Wood's, to be used by the Spirit to glorify Christ. And if you want proof the Lord doesn't need any of us, he taught you that. He taught us that when he took Nabil Qureshi at the age of 34. Okay? Because now Nabil is death, deathless, pain-free, cancer-free. He's now fully alive, albeit without his physical body. He's alive as a glorified spirit with a spiritual shape by which you can still recognize him awaiting the time when the Lord Jesus will bring his spirit and then reunite his spirit with his body that the Lord will raise and make indestructible. But what did you learn from that? You learned a valuable lesson. Jesus did, did not need Nabil and didn't wait for Nabil to be born in order to reach Muslims and get them saved. Jesus is the one who's pleased to save Nabil and use him for a season, then take him home to enter his everlasting rest to remind you Jesus is the God of creation, the God of the church, and Jesus is faithful in every generation to raise up warriors by his Holy Spirit, empowered by his Spirit to glorify the name of Jesus and preserve his church. He does that. What we contribute is sin, moral failures, resistance, and imperfections. In fact, sometimes we mess things up and get in the way. But God is still pleased to use us nonetheless. So is that clear? Is that clear? And help me to help you guys focus. Don't pontificate. Get into side discussions or debate me. It's not the time. I just want to make sure it sinks in. Now, hopefully the regulars are here. God has been blessing us. Sometimes we get about 500, but I want quality, not quantity. A lot of quality people want to learn. 
for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now that said, we're going to kill several birds with one stone in today's discussion. We're going to again affirm that God's true word, the Holy Bible, which is God's perfect words preserved perfectly by God Almighty so that we can have a reliable witness to the God that exists and what he's done for us and what he expects from us, right? The Holy Bible. So from the scriptures, we're going to see again further affirmation that Jesus is the eternal son of God who became flesh. He's the God man, the two natured person, one eternal person who has a divine nature and took a human nature, the creator of all things. And why Bible translations are important and they do matter. So we're going to be talking about several things. Bible translations, their impact, why they matter, why not all Bibles are equal, even though they translate the same manuscripts over 90% of the time and you'll get the same message, right? Still, there are these nuances, nuanced shades of meaning, that some translations do a better job of capturing than others. Everyone with me there? If you're with me, I got some articles I need to give you. The articles, God willing, will be in the description box to the video. So with my sessions, I will try to give you articles to go with the sessions so you have both something written and something to watch in order to facilitate your ability to then Absorb this information and make it second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit so you can now teach it to others for the glory of Christ. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. God, I, I hate this. Yeah, rebuke the buffering, Lord Jesus. So I'm going to give you articles so you can have both something to read, something to watch, to facilitate, facilitate, right, your ability to make this information second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit so you can then teach others and share it for the glory of Christ. Everyone with me there? So far, are you with me? Because I want to give you the articles. I know it's late for many of you, and <clears throat> for others, it's perfect time. You guys ready for the articles? All right, let's go. Here's the articles. Here are the articles. Here are the articles. Lord, loosen my tongue, save me from stammering. Article number one, all related to the theme, Jesus as creator and Bible virgins. That's the first article. We'll put them in the description box, God willing. That's the first article. Second article, article number two, Jesus Christ, the creator and sustainer of all things. Okay, focus, guys. Second article. Okay, click on them, save them for future reference. You have my permission to upload them to your websites, translate them, do what you want for the glory of Christ. As long as you're using it to see people get saved and Christians get strengthened. The third article, which is part two of this one. Okay, third article, folks. Okay. Now, the final article, the final one. Okay. Here you go. This is it. Now, with that said, let's begin our discussion. We're going to now show... How Bible translations can affect the understanding, interpretation of passages. The examples I'm going to give you, and I need you guys to listen. The examples I'm going to give you are all translating the same text. In other words, these examples do not have anything to do with variations in the manuscripts. I don't know why I'm buffering. I don't know why I'm buffering. Am I buffering for you guys? It's getting me upset. Please, Lord Jesus, strengthen the connection, Lord, and help me not to get frustrated. Okay, anyway. The examples I'm going to give you have nothing to do with variations in the manuscripts. The examples are all based on the same texts. They're translating the same Greek or Hebrew. Are you with me there? So it's not an issue of a variation. It's an issue of how to translate the original languages properly and correctly. Right? Yeah, when I buffer, I get angry and I start like hitting the table, trying to correct the buffering as if that's going to do something. Okay, so are we ready? 
We're going to use the King James as our primary translation, and then we're going to compare it to other translations. So are you ready now? I need your attention. So Christ will be glorified. Do not let Satan distract you. Rebuke that in Jesus' name. Focus. And these articles will give you the Greek, the syntax, very simple to understand. So what I'm about to say here, those articles discuss in depth. That's why you got to have those articles. Okay. John 1, verse 3 in the King James Version. John 1, verse 3 in the King James Version. Now follow with me. We're going to compare the King James, for the most part, with the NIV. The reason why is because the two best-selling Bible translations in America, in fact, in English-speaking churches, among English-speaking churches, the two best-selling English versions happen to be the NIV and the King James. Keep that in mind. So I'm going to use King James primarily with the NIV, and we'll look at a few others. Now keep that in mind. Notice, let's see who's going to catch it. All things were made by him. Speaking of the word, the Lord Jesus and his pre-human existence. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. One more time. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now let's look at the NIV. Let's look at the NIV. Let's see who's astute. And paying attention carefully. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Who caught it? No, you didn't catch it, India. Shamir got it. Gaming stuff got it. First and last got it. Angie got it. The differences between by and through. Did Jesus, did the create was the creation created by Jesus or through Jesus? Ah, you got it. And you're gonna see why. The difference in the translation of the Greek preposition, dia. It's dia d. Shortened form, right? Dia d, right? <clears throat> The difference in translating that Greek preposition is used by anti-Trinitarians, those who seek to rob Jesus of his glory and demote Jesus from the status of being God Almighty. They use the difference in the translation to show that Jesus is not the Almighty Creator, but that the Almighty Creator is God the Father, and that God created through Jesus, so Jesus had a secondary role, in order to rob Jesus of being the almighty creator of all things. You with me there? Now let's compare John 1.10, King James Version, and NIV. I'm about to LOL Muhammad, that filthy dog and bastard of Satan, if you're a Mohammedan. So watch your mouth. I'm going to bury your filthy prophet. Respect your filthy Quran, that satanic book of porn, chapter 6, verse 108. But you're a dog. You have no respect for your God or Muhammad, which is why you do that so we can insult Muhammad and bury that filthy swine, that pig in hell, where he deserves to be. Glory to Jesus Christ. All right. John 1.10. Pay attention. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The world was made by him. Now let's look at the NIV. Yeah, I'm going to show you my thoughts on the Talmud. Here's my thoughts on the Talmud. Snack, are you ready for my thoughts on the Talmud? Are you ready? Okay, here you go. He was in the world, right? And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. So was the world made by him or through him? Wicked, please don't pontificate. Sit there and listen. Don't help me to help you. Just listen. Okay. So everyone seeing that? You see how when the King James translation was the chief translation for English-speaking churches for over 300 years, everyone read these verses as stating that 
Creation was created by Jesus. That Jesus created all things in an active primary sense, not in a secondary sense, in a secondary role. Ned, here, let, let me show you what's on topic. Ned, hold on, hold on, brother. You ready, Ned? Ned, are you ready? Ned, are you ready? There you go, Ned. See, I want quality people, not arrogant jerks who think they know the languages to impress us, as if the dative is going to help his case, being slick. Oh, dative? Oh, like I know Greek. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know Greek just as much as my brother does. Hold on a second. The dative? Is it genitive? Is it dative? Is it is it accusative, nominative? Do you hold the dative? Okay, yeah. These arrogant jerks, they want to sound impressive and intelligent. Oh my goodness, okay. All right, now, what about the translations that follow the same fa uh, family of manuscripts for the most part that the King James does? For example, New King James and Modern English Version. Are you ready? Let's see the New King James and the Modern English Version. John 1, 3, John 1, 10. Is this stuff boring you guys? Or are you learning about your Bible translations? Exactly. And are you finally getting it, right? Okay. Is that the New King James? You didn't tell me. You didn't tell me if that's the New King James. <clears throat> Hold on. He doesn't. He just posted. doesn't tell me if it's New King. Okay. Okay, don't get upset. First last dude, bro. Chill. Better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Here, New King James. All things are made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. John 1.10, New King James. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Now, modern English version. Modern English version, John 1.3, John 1.10. Modern English version. All things were created through him, and without him nothing was created that was created. John 1.10, modern English version. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not know him. Do you see that? <clears throat> With the rise, the proliferation of modern versions, the Greek of John 1.3 and John 1.10 is now translated as creation being made, coming to existence through Jesus, Whereas up until the rise of modern translations for over 300 years, English-speaking Christians who only followed the King James read in their Bibles that all creation came into existence by Jesus. All creation was created by Jesus. The world was created by Jesus, which correctly indicates that Jesus didn't play a secondary role a secondary inferior role to the Father in creation. He's just as responsible for creating all things as the Father and the Holy Spirit are. He's just as responsible in creating all things as the Father and the Spirit happen to be. He played an active role to the same extent the Father and Spirit did. You're getting it? Okay, everyone getting it? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple more examples. A couple more examples. <clears throat> We're going to compare again King James and IV, the primary translations. King James and IV. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Hebrews 1, verse 2. King James and IV. And we're going to go into some meat. Okay? Hebrews 1, verse 2. Here's the King James. Hath in these last days... Spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed a bearer of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. By whom also he made the worlds. NIV. Okay, watch here. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Through whom also he made the universe. Exactly the only way. That's exactly the argument of the anti-Trinitarians and cultists. They use that argument the only way. Let me repeat what the only way said, just like Ender got it. NIV makes it sound like Jesus was just the tool of God. That's exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. 
So you guys are getting it. The light switch went on. Light switch went on. Ah. Michelle, you got it. I want to kiss your head. One word can destroy a man's beliefs. And guys, can I prove to you that's exactly what anti-Trinitarian cultists do? Here's the link. James White, one of the best Trinitarian apologists we have, debates a former Trinitarian turned heretic, Patrick Navis. Is Jesus God? And their debate is in two parts. In part two, they debate the proper meaning of the following passages. I'm going to give you the link. John 12, 41, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, Hebrews 1, and Colossians 1, 15 to 17. So along with Jesus' as I am sayings. I'm going to give you the link. Actually, Muhammad is dead, and he's a filthy scum pig, bastard of the devil, buried in hell by Jesus Christ, Muhammad's God and judge. Here's the link, guys. Okay? Do me a favor. Can you do me a favor? Click on the link. Focus for the glory of Jesus. Don't let Satan's children distract you. I just gave you the link. Click on the link. Listen to the debate. That's precisely Patrick Novice's argument, which James White soundly refutes. Glory to Jesus. Praise the Lord for our brother James White. When it comes to the Trinity, he does a phenomenal job. He schools him on the Greek prepositions. But Patrick Novice used the preposition to show that Jesus played a lesser secondary role and even says Jesus is not identified as the creator. God the Father is the creator and Jesus was used by the Father to bring all creation into existence. That's exactly his argument, guys. Are you listening? By the power of the Holy Spirit, you focus so you can learn and grow. Jonathan Terrell, can you call me on Skype so I can emulate your mother for being a satanic slut, giving birth to a satanic bastard like you? Can you call me on Skype so I can embarrass you with your logic? Are you man enough? Are you more man than your than your mother to call me and debate, debate your logic so I can humiliate you for the glory of Jesus? Muzzle another filthy dog of the devil? Oh, you can download it for free, you filthy dog. Go here. And if you don't, I'm going to muzzle you like the Shia muzzled your mother. You got 10 minutes to call me or I'm going to Skype. I'm going to block you. See, when a filthy demon, a demonic bastard of the devil comes and robs Jesus of his glory, I shame and humiliate him and his mother for being a tool of the devil to being, give birth to such a satanic bastard like you. But you're not man enough, right? You're not more man than your mother. You won't call to defend your filthy God, your satanic God. Tommy, did Elijah love the prophets of Baal? Did Paul love the Judaizers who preached the gospel? Or did they mock and insult them and call them dogs and sons of the devil, Tommy? But you're stupider because if someone insulted your mother, you would be zealous for honor. But you have no honor. You'll let someone rob Jesus of his glory. And you're going to play the love your neighbor card because you are a filthy dog as well, Tommy. Okay. Okay. Now for the rest of you. In Jesus' name, focus. You guys focused? Yeah. Everyone here focusing? Here's the link again. Here's the link again. Listen to how Patrick Navis uses that very argument that the preposition shows that Jesus is not the creator. He denies that Jesus is the creator. And he says that the Father is the creator. And that the Father used Jesus as a tool to bring creation into being. He used that very argument. And glory to Jesus, James White schooled him on the Greek and the implication of the prepositions. Are you with me there? Let's look at a few more examples. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, King James versus NIV. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, King James versus NIV. Let's see if you guys catch the difference. So I hope you saved that link to that discussion. But to us, there's but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. By whom are all things, and we by him. But now NIV. Focus, guys. NIV. 
Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, from whom all things came into being, from whom all things came, and for whom we live, from whom all things came, and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. Did you see in every single passage where the inspired author by, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit affirms Jesus' role in creating all things, the King James translates the Greek prepositions as by, showing that Jesus played an active role and that he's just as much responsible for the creation of all things as the Father and the Spirit are, whereas the NIV, by translating it as through, can be manipulated by cultists and anti-Trinitarians to show that Jesus' role was secondary and not primary like the Father's. Everyone there? Pray the buffering goes away in Jesus' name so I don't lose my testimony and bust this computer. Everyone got it? Let's look at another one. Colossians 1.16. Colossians 1.16. King James versus NIV. Colossians 1.16. King James versus NIV. Okay, Jonathan, then you got to get out of here. Get Jonathan out of here. He said he's scared, but he's not scared of Jesus, God Almighty, whom he is dishonoring. Get him out of here. Colossians 1.16. Is that King James? Or did you give me the NIV? King James versus NIV. Okay, one more time. One more time. King James versus NIV. Let's see. No, you didn't give me the King James. You gave me the NIV the first time. See, first and last, you're dropping the ball. This is why you threw me off. That was the NIV. You wicked, deceitful sinner. That's the King James. Yeah, see? That's where I got thrown off. In him and through him is uh, NIV. You wicked sinner, dude. The Muslims are getting to you. Okay, guys, let's not get confused. King James. I knew that wasn't the King James. That's why it said in him and through him. Okay, one more time. King James, Colossians 1.16. One more time. Colossians 1.16, King James. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now, Colossians 1.16, NIV. For in him all things were created. Even that, if you don't understand the meaning of in him, can mislead you into thinking creation came out of him. That creation was a part of him and came out of him, right? In him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. And for him. Through him or for him? Even the word in him. That can miscommunicate. Obviously, these were evangelical Trinitarians. They believe Jesus is the eternal creator, one with the Father and the Spirit. And he didn't play a secondary, passive role. And they don't believe creation came out of Christ. But that Christ brought creation into being from nothing. But you see how someone who's not trained and he sees in him and will misunderstand what in him means? What do you mean in him? In him was creation and he created it out of himself? Right? Everyone with me there? I want it to sink in before I move on. Let's see. Just a few days after I... Okay. Here's this link I want you to listen to, although it's from Chick Tracks. This is the gentleman I was talking about, David W. Daniels. He is a bona fide scholar. He has studied languages. He even went to Fuller and used to be anti-King James and followed the scholarly community in embracing modern versions 
and also believing that the earliest Greek copies of the New Testament books should be prioritized because they're superior, but then changed his position and has become King James only. Now, he does work for Jack Chick, and I said to my Catholic brothers, Orthodox brothers, there's a lot I disagree with, and some of the things they say can be cruel and harsh, and there are some factual errors. So don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? In other words, take the things he says that are good and solid and ignore all, everything else. That's what I do with everyone. I'll hear someone out when I think he says something that, are, that is solid and factual and faithful to Scripture, I'll accept it. When I believe he's diverging from the facts or misinterpreting the facts or distorting the facts, I ignore that. Here's a video he did, okay, on this very issue. Can I play it? Would you guys mind if I play it? You guys, it's a very, it's it's about this very issue. And notice the title it says, Is Jesus Creator or Middleman? Middleman in quotations. Can I just play it? Okay, listen to me. Listen to him. I started Bible college in 1981. Just a few days after I started Bible college in 1981, an article came out in Time Magazine about a United Church of Christ minister named Mansfield Caseman who wanted to be ordained a Presbyterian minister. They asked him what should have been a simple question. Was Jesus Christ God? Caseman answered, no, God is God. Well, that's kind of obvious. God is God. But is Jesus Christ God? Caseman refused to answer. In fact, Caseman refused to say whether Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead or even to define the Godhead in any detail. Okay, so the guy's a heretic. Get rid of him. That's not what they did. After a fierce debate, a majority decided that they would ordain him as a Presbyterian minister anyway. Can you believe it? Okay, almost done. Listen to his argument. And I agree with what the brother said. There's a lot of stuff about Chick that you need to reject. It's factually incorrect. But there's stuff that he says when it comes to Bible versions. Hear him out, and whatever he's right, accept. Wherever he's wrong, reject. For the glory of Jesus Christ. Now listen. Listen to the point he makes. What would cause a person to think that Jesus Christ wasn't God? It couldn't be the Bible that he read, could it? Well, let me tell you about something that I read that made me think that Jesus Christ wasn't the creator after all. You won't believe how tiny it was. It was just one little word. Would you like to know what it was? One tiny I, little I'm word. David Daniels from Chick Publications. When I graduated... Bible college. I was a top Greek student. I went directly into advanced Greek at Fuller Seminary in 84. You'd think that would mean I knew something, wouldn't you? But see, all I knew is what I was taught. How do I know that what my Greek professors said or the books they taught from were correct? How would I know? But the meaning of a single tiny Greek word and a tiny English word. Listen to this information. In it's verse, me. Got me to think that Jesus Christ wasn't the creator after all. Wasn't the creator after all. I started to think of Jesus as more of a middleman. And my professors, including my Greek professor, didn't help. Please open your Bible to John chapter 1, verse 3. Listen. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Seems simple enough. All things were made by him. What does that make Jesus? The creator. Even a five-year-old can tell you that. That's the reading, and I checked it for myself, of the Wycliffe of 1384, the Reformation Bibles of the 1500s, the 1600s, 1700s. Look, even the Catholic Rames Dewey of uh, 15, 1752 couldn't deny it. Did you catch it? Notice what he's telling you. All the English translations of the Bibles up until the King James, even the Dewey Rames, which is English translation of the Vulgate, all of them read by him. Are you with me there? Do you hear what he's saying? All the English translations... Before the King James. So you can't say it's a King James bias. 
the English translations done by those who came before the King James translators and even the Dewey Rames translation, all of them rendered the Greek preposition D as by, by him. All things were created by him. Okay? So the King James was simply following the tradition that came before it. Listen to this. This is gold. Gold. Honestly, it's gold. All the way through the Noah Webster of 1833, they all said the same thing. All things were made by him. Then, in 1870, 1870, a huge Greek interlinear was published called the Emphatic Diaglot, and everything changed. One tiny word was changed in John 1.3. Instead of saying that all things were made by him, it said all things were made through him. Did you see what he said? It changed because of this Emphatic Diaglot. Diaglot that was published in 1870, right? <clears throat> you know why that's interesting, folks? That's the very diaglot that the Jehovah's Witnesses use to justify their mistranslation of the Greek New Testament. Do you know that? So you see what he just said? When the emphatic diaglot was published, it changed the translation of D. From by to through, and that's the very emphatic diaglot that the Jehovah's Witnesses use in their literature to justify their perversion of the Greek. Don't take my word for it. Go online to the JW.org, type in in their search engine, emphatic diaglot, diaglot, D-I-A-G-L-O-T-T, -T, right? Diaglot. And they're often referencing that to justify their perversion of the Greek New Testament into English. So listen to this, the pernicious influence that this diaclot had. It's not rocket science. If all things are made through him and not by him, then he's not doing the creating, is he? Uh huh. He's not the creator. He's just a middleman. If God created all things through Jesus, but God did create all things, then doesn't that lower Jesus maybe to a little less than God? Just a little bit. Focus, guys. No side talk. See, in the 1870s, it was very popular and growing in popularity to believe that Jesus Christ wasn't God. Back then, they called them Unitarians. Um, three of them in 1870 were on a Bible committee to change the Bible. That became the English Revised Version. That's another story. It's in Look What's Missing. But how would you get other people to believe such a lie as this? Well, first, you'd have to ch change the books teaching New Testament Greek. Then you'd need to change the commentaries on John chapter 1. And finally, you'd want to change the translation so it no longer said by, but through him all things were created. It didn't change in the English Revised Version of 1881. But John Nelson Darby in his. Oh, boy. Am I still buffering, man? Yeah, I know she is. I'm sorry. For me, it's buffering. Can you ask the Lord Jesus to bless this connection, rebuke Satan, and crucify my flesh? Okay, sorry. I thought it was buffering. It's killing me, guys, because from my opinion, it's buffering. 81. Listen. But John Nelson Darby in his Bible of 1884 and 1890 Listen. changed by to through. And starting with the American Standard Version of 1901 published by Thomas Nelson, John 1.3 now said through, not by. Almost all Bibles said it now. I made a chart. I'll make that available. All these Bibles don't say that all things were made by him. They say all things were made by through him. The New American Standard had it right. Even it said by him. However, they changed that in the 1995 update, and now it also says through. Did you catch it? The New American Standard Bible, when it first came out, said by him, but then they revised it, 1975, I believe he said, to, to through. Do you see what I said yesterday? It confirms what I was saying yesterday. With the King James, you have a fixed standard. 
The King James, it's a fixed standard. It won't change anymore. With modern versions, they'll be constantly updating them and changing them until the Lord Jesus returns. You see? Did you hear it? Are you seeing what's happening before your eyes? And it's happening in such a subtle fashion. In such a subtle fashion. Well, then go rewind, Jay. Don't, guys, if you're coming in the middle of this, don't ask me questions. Please respect everyone else. Rewind, go start listening and catch up. Don't disturb us in the middle, please. Okay. You see what's happening? The subtle attack on the translations of the Bible is taking place before our eyes, but it's so subtle that we're not catching it. It's as if we're asleep. Right? But glory to Jesus Christ, the Almighty God, who loves his church and loves his creatures, to raise up men and women of integrity to make these facts known for us so that we don't have an excuse to be asleep, that we are awake and alert spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Let's finish it. Listen. Don't look to the New King James to save you. Listen. It also says through. 1979, 82, all of them. So did the first of the King James lookalikes, the modern King James version of 1962, and this rare 1971 edition here of the King James 2 version also says through. Even the 2014 MEV, the modern English version, also says through. Et tu brute? Yep. After years of searching, I found out that God really did keep his promise to preserve his words. And those words are preserved accurately, perfectly in English in the King James Bible. Jesus Christ is the creator. All things are created, made by him. Amen. Preach it. But he's also the judge. And I would not want to be there to watch all these new version writers being judged by him. Amen. You? You? Let me close with this. You may not have this problem. Here's the link. You may know that God is the creator and, through, and Jesus Christ is God and Jesus Christ is the creator. You may have a strong theology. Understand what he's about to say. This is now very important how he ends it. You know the Trinity is true. You know Jesus is God Almighty. You know these passages teach that Jesus is the active creator. He played an active role. Just as much as the Father and Spirit did, because the one God is Father, Son, and Spirit, and all three persons of the Godhead are fully responsible for all creation. They all played an active role. And creation belongs to all three persons. Creation is the work of all three persons equally. You know that. You know that. But here's the problem. The generation that's highly biblically illiterate who go to churches that are watered down and compromised and are not being taught the meat of the word. They don't know that. Listen. You may have good Bible doctrine, but there is a generation of people that has arisen called the millennials. And right. many of them agree with Mansfield Casement. They think that Jesus Christ is a good guy, but he's not God. Are you going to give them a Bible that feeds that doubt or are you going to give them a bible that they can put their faith in that puts jesus in his rightful place as creator of the universe he is the creator and says all things are created by him make your choice just realize you're responsible for the outcome god bless you and have a wonderful day okay all the links to these articles and videos will be in the description box. So you, ca you caught it, right? You caught it. Now, let me help you. Here's my article here. I gave you the articles. We're now going to look at my article because now I'm going to prove to you from the Greek. Are you ready now? I'm going to prove to you from the Greek that the Greek words used to describe Jesus' role in creation do not 
assign him a secondary lesser role because those very Greek words are used for God the Father and his role in creation. Are you ready? You want me, right? You went with me? The preposition, Thomas, I know you like to pontificate a lot, brother. God bless you. The preposition N is also contextually determined, right? N and dia, D, and so on and so forth, and is. N, is, D, dia, D, a contraction of dia. Are you now ready? I'm going to show you that the prepositions used to describe Jesus' role in creating all things are used of God Almighty, showing that Jesus did not assume a secondary lesser role. But I'm going to be reading from my article. Why do you think I wrote those articles? I wrote those articles because of this issue. Okay, here you go. That's the link. And I didn't use the King James here just to show the point that even translating it through, when you look at the Greek and compare the Greek, you can't say he's, he's assuming a secondary inferior role. I'm just going to go to the article. I want you to pay attention. I'm going to give you the English translation, the Greek that's relevant to the point here. John 1, 3, all things came into being through him. That's the translation I'm using because I'm just going with it for argument's sake. The Greek words are D, the preposition D, autu. D, autu, remember, D, autu, John 1, 10. He was in the world and the world came into being through him, by him. D -au -tu. And in Romans 9, 5, it's all in my article, guys. So you can click on it and read along with me, okay? In Romans 9, 5, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is overall epipanton. Overall epipanton. God bless forever. Amen. Okay. We're going to go slow here. It's all my articles. D au tu, D, the preposition, contracted form of dia, D au tu, and Jesus is epi pantone overall. Everyone got that so far? You got that so far? You got it? I just want to make sure you're getting it. All right. Let's go to the other examples. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Yet for us, there's one God, the Father, for whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, D who, D who are all things. D who, D au tu, D who are all things. And through whom, D au tu, we exist. So remember these words. D au tu, D who, epi pantone. D au tu, D who, epi pantone. I gave you that in translation in the article. You don't even need to, need to know Greek, okay? Remember these prepositions. Okay, now Colossians 1, 16, 17. For in him, en auto, en auto, en, okay, auto. Okay, remember that. In him, better by him, in him can miscommunicate. All things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him, d au tu, for him, ace autan, ace or heis autan. No, 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 it's not heis. I'm sorry, forget it. Don't pronounce it heis. Forget it. Lord save me from error. Ace autan. So remember this: Jesus is said to have created d au tu, d who, and auto, right? Ace autan. So the prepositions I want you to remember are D, okay, N, Ace, D, N, Ace, D auto, D who, N auto, Ace autan. Can you remember that? By him, in him, for him. Can, you guys so far with me, right? So far you with me? And then Hebrews 1, 2. But in these last days, these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom, D, who, he also created the worlds. Through whom, by whom, 
Dehu, he also created the worlds. And thank our brother first last, Lord Jesus bless him, for posting these verses from my article. Okay, so before I move on, I want to sound like a broken record. Why? Because I want you to learn this. I want you to understand this. I want you to absorb this. Make it second nature so now you can teach it for the glory of Jesus and save people from being deceived. All right? So all creation is de autu, by him or through him, de who, right? And auto, auto, ace autan, de and ace. Okay. Now, if you got that, what does the New Testament say about God? Okay. Acts 17, 28, speaking of God who made the world. If you read Acts 17, 24, 28, it says God who made the world. This is referring to God the Father in the context. God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth. Now, notice what it says about him. See, I just realized I have a, top, a typo. Stink. Okay. For in him, in God, we live and move and have our being. In God the Father, in him, we live and move and have our being. Guess what the Greek words are? En au to. In him, en au to. The very words used of Jesus in Colossians 1.16. So creation was brought into being and sustained. En au to applied to God the Father and Jesus Christ. Same words. That's the first one. Same words. Okay. Romans 11.36, again, speaking of God Almighty, the Father. God and God the Father. Romans 11.36. Notice the prepositions. Romans 11.36. Speaking of God the Father. For from Him and through Him, di autu, and to Him, eis autan, are all things. The very words used of Jesus in Colossians 1.16. When Paul says all things are through him and for him, in Greek it says all things are diautu and for him, eis autan, through Jesus and for Jesus, the very words used of God the Father here. From him, through him, diautu, and to him, for him, are all things. Same language. Here it is. Same words, prepositions. One place Paul says, diautu, ace autan, in reference to God the Father. All things are diautu, ace autan, reference to God the Father. But then in Colossians 1.16, he says, all things were created, diautu, ace autan, in reference to Jesus. Would anyone assume that because these prepositions are used for God the Father, that shows that the Father played a secondary, lesser role? Would anyone assume that? Would anyone assume that? Yep, in him. But it's better, Nick, to translate it as by him. Because in him, in a new age context, can miscommunicate. Right, Nick? When you say to a new ager, all creation is in him. Oh, yeah, that's panty, right? But anyway, let's continue. Oh, man, I'm listening to you. Man, you see what I did? Ephesians 4. See, good, I caught it. Here, I forgot the verse. It's Ephesians 4, verse 6. Two typos I saw. Ephesians 4, 6. One God and Father of all. That's Ephesians 4, verse 6. Who is above all. Epipanton. The very words used of Jesus in Romans 9, 5. God the Father is above all, epi, panton, same words used of Jesus, Romans 9, 5, and through all, dia, and in all, ain. Wow. Really? Interesting. The final example, Hebrews 2.10. Hebrews 2.10. The final example. Hebrews 2.10, again speaking of God the Father. God the Father. Well, that's my article. I hope it has spiritual meat. If it didn't, then I'd have to block you. Hebrews 2.10, speaking of God the Father. It was fitting that God, 
for whom the own use of Jesus in First Corinthians 8 6, through whom the who use of Jesus Christ, all things exist. The own the who used of God the Father and used of Jesus Christ in describing their relationship to all creation, creating all things, sustaining all things, and bringing many children to glory should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. Everyone got it? There's two typos here. I got to correct now. Darn it. So now let me ask you a question. If the same language prepositions are used for the Father and the Son in their roles in creating all things and sustaining all things, why would someone assume that Jesus is taking a secondary, lesser role than that taken by the Father when the same language is used to describe the Father's role in creating and sustaining all things that's used of the Son, showing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are fully responsible for all creation, and all three were fully active to the same degree in creating all things and sustaining all things. So now, be upfront with me. I'm not trying to sell you on the King James. Of all the versions out there, which version was most Christ-honoring and translated in such a way where you could not be confused and misled into thinking that Jesus' own creation was secondary to the Father? That's it. There you go. Now, do you want further proof that Jesus' role in creation is active, primary? He's just as responsible for, for creating all things as the Father and the Spirit are? Okay, let's go to Psalm 102, verse 1. Psalm 102, verse 1. Psalm 102, verse 1. I hope this is blessing you. I hope this is encouraging you. I hope you're getting me. You're getting further illumination and insight, and it's blowing you away how miraculously consistent and supernatural our Bible is, and that the Bible, if properly translated, if correctly translated, shouts, Jesus is Yahweh, Jehovah, God Almighty, fully, eternally equal to the Father and the Spirit in essence, in nature, in power and glory and honor, because Jesus is just as much God as the Father and the Spirit are, Three persons, one God. Okay. Psalm 102, verse 1, brother. Post it again. A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry unto thee. So Psalm 102, 1 is written about whom? Psalm 102, 1 is written about whom? Let me read it again. A prayer of the afflicted when he's overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Hear up my prayer, O Lord, and let me let my cry come unto thee. Okay, now let's go to Psalm 102 12. Psalm 102 12. Father, bring them for your glory in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit. Psalm 102, verse 12. But thou, O Lord Jehovah, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. So there is no doubt, right? The psalmist is glorifying, praising the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, right? No doubt about it, right? No doubt about it, right? Okay, let's see what the psalmist says about the Lord God and his role in creation. Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Of old hast thou, he's speaking to the Lord Jehovah now, the psalmist saying to Jehovah, of old, in the beginning, long ago, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. You, Jehovah, created the heavens by your own hands, by your own infinite power, plural to show the infinitude of his power. And you personally laid down the foundation of the earth. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou, you will roll up creation like a garment. You're rolling it up because you're sustaining creation because you made it by your own power. 
a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Now notice what the psalmist said about Jehovah God. You, Jehovah, are the eternal, unchangeable, immutable creator, sustainer of all things. Unlike creation, which is wearing out and growing old, you remain the same. Your years never end. You laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands, and you rolled them up. So here it's talking about jo Jehovah's active role in creation. He actively creates all things and sustains all things, right? It's talking about Jehovah, right? Okay, now here's where I need you to type less and listen more. Don't type, read. Let it sink in by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now watch what Hebrews does with this passage. Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 12. Let's read it slowly. And follow with me, please. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit, I hope you get it. Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 12. But unto the Son, to the Son, he saith. So now the Father is talking to the Son. To the Son, he, the Father, says to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou, this is God the Father speaking about the Son. You, thou, the Son, thou hast loved righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, thy God, even thy God, the Father became Jesus' God when Jesus became man. Thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now pay attention. The conversation continues. The Father continues addressing the Son in verse 10. So what does the Father say to the Son? And thou, Lord, Father speaking, saying, thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. In Hebrews 1, verses 10 to 12, the Father took the words of Psalm 102. And used the words of Psalm 102 to describe his son, Jesus, as the Lord, who at the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, who created the heavens by his own hands, who then rolls them up, and they wear out, but his son remains the same, and his years never end. So the Father glorifies and praises the Son, and says, you, my Son, are that unchangeable, immutable creator, who personally created the heavens by your own hands, who personally laid the foundations of the earth, and you're sustaining them and rolling them up. Does that sound like Jesus took a secondary role to the Father? Is that what it sounds like? Is that what it sounds like, folks? This is all of those articles I gave you. Do you want to let it sink in for a minute? The only way God the Father Almighty can take the words of Psalm 102, a psalm praising the eternal, unchangeable Jehovah God as the unchangeable, immutable, almighty creator, sustainer of all creation. The only way the Father can take those words and apply it to the Son and glorify and praise the Son as that God Almighty who is unchangeable is if Jesus is the eternal Almighty Creator, Sustainer, who never changes. That's why we're Trinitarians. Okay, let it sink in. I want to, I want to give you a minute to sink in. Right? So even when these anti-Trinitarians use modern versions that render the preposition as through, I then turn the tables against them and show, well, hold on. Those same prepositions are used of the Father's role in creation. None of you will say that the Father took a secondary role and not a primary one. You see what I'm doing here? God bless you, Truth for Life Ministries. The Lord Jesus prosper you for his glory and preserve you and bless you abundantly as you proclaim the truth of our God with passion and boldness. But... Let's say someone doesn't have access to the Greek and someone can't make the Greek accessible and clear for a layperson. 
and doesn't have the time for all that studying. And you wanted to give him a Bible that captured all that without requiring that person to know the languages or how these words are used. The Greek words are used of the father showing that Jesus's role is just as essential and primary as the father. What translation would you give him or her? What translation? Kenneth, you have to also know who to study Greek from because the Greek New Testament is being taught by these very professors, right, who have been tainted and polluted by Greek lexicons, right, and by scholarship that's not thoroughly biblical and Christ-honoring. Okay? FG, when you say it's bad, you decide, my friend. It's not so much that it's bad as it is not as good and accurate and solid in these places, in these places, in comparison to the King James. You with me there? Now, I want to just give you a minute to sink in because if, if you guys are blessed, you're challenged, you're being fed, as Holy Spirit guides me to bless you and saves me from error, right? There's some other points I want to discuss, but if you're bored and you're tired and you're tortured, I can end it. It's up to you guys. Ender, thank you for that statement. Let me just repeat what you said. You increase my respect for the King James Version. Is it a coincidence that of all the Bibles... The only one that gets denigrated and attacked worse than the King James is the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that a coincidence? Even those who will tell you, no, the King James is a great Bible. They'll say that out of one side of their mouth, but in the very next sentence, they'll go to denigrate it and say that it's not accurate based on inferior manuscripts and it's archaic and you need other Bibles. The only translation that I know that's denigrated worse than the King James is the Norwood translation of Joe's Witnesses. Right? So you're going to have a scholar saying, no, I love the King James. I respect the King James. And then the next sentence, it's archaic. It's outdated. It's based on inferior manuscripts. So you should have a King James, but have other translations, which are superior and better. Right? You get my point? Now, let me give you a few more examples. Now, these examples that I'll give you, one of them, okay, Diana, I don't want you to come back to my channel anymore. You are a disgrace to your fellow Catholics because I've been paying attention to you. Don't block her yet. I want her to hear this. All you do when you come to my channel is you keep talking about the Catholic Church being the true church and disrespecting the Orthodox, the Assyrian Church of the East, and the Coptic, and also making your fellow Catholics look bad because you are a jerk. You are a disgrace to the Catholic Church. You're a lowlife tool of the devil. Get the hell out of my channel now. That's all she does. That's all she does. She did it yesterday. She does it today. Giving Catholics a bad name. And by the way, I'm very impartial in this area. Okay. I do this to anyone, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Syrian Church of the East. If they're jerks, I'll give you the same, same treatment. Every stinking time she comes to this channel, she's Catholic Church is the true church. The Catholic Bible is the true Bible. And you think you're endearing yourself to, to people? You think your people are going to want to consider the Catholic Church or they're going to get upset and offended? And see you no better than a fanatic, like a fanatical Protestant who attacks the Catholic Church. Disgusting slime you are. Sorry, brethren. And by the way, if you guys are going to think I only pick on Catholics, then you're liars. I don't. I pick on everyone. I'm an equal opportunist offender. In fact, I don't know if you guys are aware of it. Let me tell you how much of an equal opportunist offender I am. You know those talks by Craig Trulia? You remember the talks that Craig Julia did for my YouTube channel?
just real in passing. The Orthodox Christian, when he did those two talks on my on my channel, you know I deleted them. I removed them from my channel. I deleted his talks and I blocked them from my Facebook. You know why? Because he was going after William Albrecht viciously and attacking his character. And I deleted his stuff. Because William Albrecht is my brother in Christ. And we are a team. And I love him for the sake of the Lord. And he came in that one session. Instead of making a positive case for what he believes about Mary. He started attacking William and others. And then got upset when I gave William a platform to give a response to those attacks. Without even mentioning my name. So I blocked him and I deleted his talks. That's how fair I am. Greg Julia, that's how fair I am. I'm not flawless. I'm not perfect. I'm not sinless. I got issues like everyone else. But when I tell you I love the Orthodox, the Catholic, the Assyrian Church, and the Coptic, and the various Protestant groups who are Trinitarian, I'm not saying it to tickle your ears and be a crowd pleaser. It's my conviction. This is what I believe. And I will not tolerate people coming here attacking other groups or propping their group, making others feel second best or inferior. You're not doing it in my channel. You want to do it, go start your channel or go to a channel that does it. All right? With that said, I keep noticing this girl every time she comes. Yeah, the Catholic Church is best church. The Catholic Bible. Think the Catholic Bible. Hey, Catholic. I'm manifesting. Timmy, 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 Timmy. Why you do this, Timmy? Timmy. All right. What a disgrace, man. You disgrace your fellow Catholics. You're a disgrace to them. Anyway, Lord Jesus be glorified. All right, are we now back? Yeah, you broke. You guys been breaking me. Okay, let me give you a few more examples to wrap things up in this session. Okay. Okay. Let me give you a few more examples. One example, they're translating the same text. Another example, they're translating a variant. You with me there? Let me show you another example. One example, they're translating the same text. So it's the same text before them, but they're translating it differently. And their translation does affect our understanding of the nature of Christ. Another example has to do with a variant reading, and even that variant reading is translated differently depending if you're reading King James or New King James or Modern English Version. Tyler, and you are a spiritual bastard, a satanic whore of the devil, and there's nothing you can do about it, Tyler. Nothing. <laughs> All right. Okay. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Are we ready? You guys ready for the examples? Let's go into the examples. Micah 5, verse 2. Micah 5, verse 2. King James Version. Let's start with that, guys. Pay attention now. Regroup. Ask the Lord Jesus to have mercy on us, forgive us, and constrain us, and focus. Because these are satanic distractions. Micah 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata. Pay attention. Thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah... Yet out of thee, out of you, shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth, notice it's plural, goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So did you catch it? A human ruler will arise from Bethlehem, whose goings forth, meaning his activities, he's been quite active from the beginning, from everlasting, from eternity. So this human ruler is more than a man. He's an eternal being who becomes flesh. An eternal person who steps out of eternity, enters time to become a human ruler over Israel. Everyone got it? The New King James also does an excellent job of translating it. Let's look at the New King James. New King James. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruled in Israel, 
whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Now, even the New American Standard Bible does an excellent job. New American Standard Bible. Watch here. Thank first last for staying up so late. He doesn't get paid. He does it out of his love for Jesus and us. Lord bless you, brother. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, New American Standard Bible, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Excellent, right? King James, excellent. New King James, excellent. And <clears throat> New American Standard Bible, excellent, right? This human ruler who will come out of Bethlehem, his goings forth, plural, his activities have started from the very beginning, and he's from the days of eternity. He's from everlasting. He steps out of eternity, enters into time, affirming the two natures of this one. He's eternal, therefore God, who becomes man, becomes flesh to rule over Israel. Ah, but now let's read NIV. NIV. NIV, guys, pay attention. Guys, don't let Satan distract you, please. Pay attention. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of, of, over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He has an origin, and his origins are from old, ancient times. So he's not from eternity. NIV, huh? What about the modern English version? MEV. Modern English version. MEV. Modern English version, MEV, which is supposed to be modernized King James. King James in modern English. Micah 5.2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, although you are small among the chimes of Judah, from you will come forth for me one who will be ruler over Israel, who, who his origins, his origins are from old, from ancient days. Modern English version is modernized King James. King James in modern vernacular. And yet here they diverge from the King James. Exactly, Angie. Why do you think anti-Trinitarian cultists like Jehovah's Witnesses use these versions? Because now look at how the Jehovah Witness Bible translates it. Brother, can you post the Jehovah Witness Bible? Micah 5 2. And you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, the one too little to be among the thousands of Judah, from you will come out for me the one to be ruling Israel. This is a Jehovah's Witness Bible, whose origin is from ancient times, from the days of long ago. We'd expect the Jehovah's Witnesses to translate it this way, right? Because they deny that Jesus is uncreated. But why would the NIV and the modern English version, as well as the Christian Standard Bible, Render it in such a way that can be used by anti-Trinitarians as a tool in their hands to show that even evangelicals are saying that this passage points to the origin of the ruler and the ruler is not eternal. Now, you know what is more sad? The two best-selling Bible versions... King James and NIV. They're the best-selling Bible versions in English-speaking churches around the world. Therefore, if you are going to a church that uses NIV and you read this passage, you could never use it as an Old Testament proof text that the Messiah, who's a human ruler, born of the Virgin, is from eternity because he's an eternal person becoming flesh. Now, someone said, how does the ESV read? Let's see how the ESV reads. English Standard Version. English Standard Version. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. 
There's your ESV. Whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. My, my advice as Draper, give up the New American Bible Revised Edition and stick with the Dewey Reigns translation of the Latin Vulgate if you're a Catholic and want to follow a Catholic edition. I don't think much of it, Shepherd's Ambassador. No, George Patton, let me repeat it again. If you guys want a Catholic Bible that you can trust that wasn't translated by liberal critical scholars poisoned by liberalism who were influenced by Satan, whether they realize it or not, who did not believe what the Catholic Church has taught historically, that the Bible is inerrant, inspired, historically accurate word of God, do not go with the New Jerusalem Bible. Do not go with the New American Bible stand, uh, revised edition. Stick with the Dewey Reims. Are you with me there? Because when the Dewey Reims was translated, it was translated before the King James Version. And those Catholics that translated it believe the Bible's inspired, inerrant, perfect word of God, historically accurate. And they believe they had a responsibility to translate the words in a reverent, God-fearing manner because they believe these were the words of God. The New American Bible translated by liberals, New Jerusalem Bible, liberals, liberals who pay lip service to the Catholic tradition, but believe that the Bible's full of errors, contradictions, that Moses did not write the Pentateuch. Isaiah didn't write all 66 chapters of Isaiah. Daniel wasn't written 500 years before the birth of Christ. It is a forgery attributed to a figure in the 6th century B.C. Okay? And first last quoted. Revised Standard Version, huh? But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Everyone got it? Guys, focus. Don't go off topic on side tangents, side issues. Don't ask me about variant readings right now. Just focus, please. Just focus with me. So, folks, what was wrong with English-speaking churches Sticking with the King James for over 300 years, when that guaranteed uniformity of reading, so that you know that the Christians in California would be reading the same Bible that the Christians in Chicago are reading, or the Christians in Michigan, or the Christians in <clears throat> Indiana, you would at least know all of these churches were on the same page, reading the same version, and reading the same version in the same way. Right? With the proliferation of Bibles, though they'll tell you that is a blessing, it's also a curse and can be used by cultists and anti-Trinitarians as tools of the devil to get you to doubt the Trinity and deity of Christ. In fact, you remember that link I gave you to the James White debate with Patrick Navis, N-A-V-A-S? I gave the link earlier and we'll put it in the description box. Patrick Navis was a Trinitarian. You know what influenced him to leave the Trinitarian faith? The various English versions and the various ways they rendered the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament. So he could see, oh, wait, this Bible doesn't translate this verse this way. Oh, wait. And that started producing doubts in his heart and mind whether these passages truly teach what Trinitarians have said they teach. You with me there? Now let me give you one final example, and I hope you're blessed tonight, and you save the articles and the links, and go back and re-listen to this until it becomes second nature. Upload it to your YouTube channel. Upload the articles to your websites, 
Make clips out of this. Study the information to become second nature by the grace of Jesus so you can know how to protect yourself from deception and protect the, the babes in the faith. So they have no doubt that the Bible, correctly translated, shouts the God of the Bible is the Trinity. Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, the God-man, and he is real, he lives, and the Bible is his word. Okay? Now let me give you one more example. This one has two issues with it. Are you ready? One more example. This one has two issues with it. Now, I need your attention here. It has two issues with it. One issue is that there's a variant reading. Some of the earliest copies of the Greek don't have this particular phrase. And two, the second issue is, even those Bibles that include the variant reading as part of what Paul originally wrote, don't translate the preposition the same way. What do I mean? Let's start with the NIV, Ephesians 3, verse 9. Ephesians 3, verse 9. NIV. And to make plain to everything the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. One more time, because I want it to sink in. Ephesians 3, 9. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages was uh, ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. You guys see it? God who created all things, right? Full stop, right? Right? Full stop, right? God who created all things, all right? Now, guys, read the King James Version with me. King James Version. Read it with me. Ephesians 3, 9, the King James Version. Get, get ready to be blown away. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ. That entire clause is missing in the modern versions. Post the King James Version again. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, listen to this. New King James, modern English version, since they're based on the same family of manuscripts that produced the King James, they too have that extra clause, but they don't translate the preposition the same way. Now let's see how the new King James renders it. Ephesians 3, 9. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden, in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. So they include the clause, but don't translate the preposition as by. They translate it as through. Now let's look at the modern English version. MEV. Modern English version. Exactly, Kenneth Samuel. Wait, hold on your questions. Modern English version. And to reveal for all people what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. There's that through again. Now, one thing you should take away from all this Okay, notice none of these verses are missing. None of these clauses are missing, meaning though some manuscripts don't have them and some English tr translations omit them, 
Other manuscripts have these clauses and words and sentences, and they're preserved. In other words, even though it's shocking you, step back for a moment and realize, because God is almighty, all of these clauses and phrases are preserved in the manuscript tradition. Nothing has been lost. So the debate now is, are these additional words, or are these words that though may not be found in some of the older copies, that doesn't mean it didn't exist in the older copies because we don't have all the copies that existed at that time, right? But we have ample copies showing that this clause must have been there from the beginning and therefore it's preserved in the King James Bible. So even though some versions don't have it, it's still there preserved and you have access to it. And remember what I said yesterday. Let me repeat it again. You need to go back and re-listen to last night's session. You got to listen to it. What did I say? If God is active in history, and he is, and he's active in overseeing the church and guiding the church, and he is because he's faithful and he loves this church, the spiritual body of Christ, then God would make sure, at least with the rise of the printing press, where Bibles could now be mass copied, mass produced, and then mass distributed, because prior to the printing press, you couldn't do that. Then God, who is sovereign, would guide the church to the right set of manuscripts that he wanted, wanted them to have access to, to collate, to translate from, to produce a Bible for mass production, right? And make sure that whatever readings was chosen were the readings that God was pleased with and honored by in order to form that Bible that would become mass copied and become the chief Bible for English-speaking churches for over 300 years, and that's the King James. This is why I said, on that principle alone, I may not have ample manuscript support for many of these readings, right? Because we don't have all the copies of the books of the New Testament that have ever been produced throughout the centuries, because many of them, have disappeared. Many of them were destroyed and burned. So just because what we have now that has survived, that are early, may not have these readings, that doesn't mean these readings were not there in the copies and were not part of what God originally inspired the authors to write down. You with me? So because God was pleased to make the King James translation, the cheap translation, unrivaled for over 300 years, and even till now, it's the bestseller next to the NIV. And they've even taken surveys that of all the Bible versions, those who have King James, those who actually read, have a King James Bible, people with King James Bible actually read their Bibles unlike those with modern versions. So when they compare those who have an NIV with those who have King James, those who have King James, more of them actually read their Bibles than those with an NIV. You hear me there? So what does this tell me? God has blessed this translation, honored this translation, and don't you dare tell me that he blessed and honored a translation with readings that you scholars are telling me are defective, not inspired, because then you're telling me that God allowed this translation to contain readings that are not inspired, misleading masses of people to quote these readings as the words of God, and God did nothing to stop that, but actually allow this translation to be the king of all translations. No, I can't believe that. I can't believe that for a moment. That's why my policy is, if it's in the King James Bible, it must have God's approval, backing, and blessing, which means those readings must be part of what God inspired originally. And any version that diverges from it and doesn't read the way the King James does, that version... Even though it's still technically the words of God, if it's correctly translated, because over 90% of those versions are in agreement with the King James, because these versions translate the same Greek manuscripts over 90% of the time. Still, because they lack a clause or a phrase or a word that's not a King James, that translation takes a backseat to the King James. This is why I'll never question any reading in the King James. That's my conviction. That's my belief. That's where I stand, and so be it. I don't answer to men. I answer to God.
right? Pray I don't offend my neighbors for being too loud in Jesus' name, Lord, please. So now let's, let's end it with one more example. One more example. You ready for another example? I'll give you two more examples. How about that? And, and by the way, for guys, don't forget, God willing, tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, mark your calendars, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Saturday, I'll be going live, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Lord Jesus willing, God willing, I'm live with David Wood, an apostate prophet on David Wood's channel. So make sure to show up. Hopefully the day will come. We'll get over a 1,000 quality people watching these live streams. Pray that the Lord will use this channel, guide me to speak truth without error, and give us the power to live his word perfectly and love his word perfectly, proclaim it without shame for the glory of Jesus, and that this uh, YouTube channel will be blessed and will keep expanding for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you two more. Two more examples, and we'll call it a night. No, not Philippians 2.6. That will come in a future session, 16.11. Okay. Are you ready? We're going to start with the NIV. John 3.13. John 3.13, NIV. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. One more time. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. That's NIV, right? NIV. No one has gone ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. King James Version, guys. Let's see if you notice the difference. King James Version. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Whoa. The Son of Man, who is still in heaven, even though physically is on earth. An affirmation to the omnipresence of Jesus that he's God in the flesh. Not Trinity. That Jesus is God in the flesh. That physically on earth, but as God, he fills heaven and earth because he's omnipresent. In two dimensions simultaneously. You know what's amazing? Many early church fathers and many early Greek manuscripts have that clause. Do you know that? It is well attested. So if they're going by evidence, because they're the ones who are saying, we need to look at the earliest witnesses, prioritize the earliest Greek copies, and then see what the fathers say. Well, many fathers quoted that extra clause, and many early copies have that extra clause, and they still reject it. Leah, you are a filthy dog, bastard of the devil, and I'll muzzle you like the dog you are, and you don't have the guts to call me so I can muzzle you, you child of the devil. The Lord Jesus, break your mouth. And humble you for his glory in Jesus' name. Don't you love it? These guys think I'm going to back down from them. John 3.13, one more time, King James. One more time. John 3.13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. A clear attestation to the two natures of Jesus. That Jesus is God, who is man, and as a man in a physical body, his physical body is limited to one location. But as God, he's omnipresent. He fills two dimensions simultaneously, and he oversees two dimensions simultaneously, heaven and earth. Because he's God in the flesh, a clear affirmation of his omnipresence, even while he's on earth physically. Just like Jesus is omnipresent now, filling heaven and earth, while physically, bodily, he's in heaven. His physical body's in heaven, but as God, he's in heaven and earth, filling all things, overseeing everything. Right? Are you ready for the final example? What's going on with just myself? Is he acting up? I thought he was kosher. Are you ready for the final example? Final example? Okay. NIV, 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16, NIV. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen 
by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. He, he <clears throat> appeared in the flesh. King James Version, 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16, King James Version. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed in the world, received up into glory. So was it God that was manifest in the flesh? Or was it he that was manifest in the flesh? Now, let me leave you with this. Are you ready? Let me leave you with this. Okay, I want you to think about this. Let's assume, for argument's sake, the original reading of 1 Timothy 3.16 said, he was manifest in the flesh. Haas. Truth for Life Ministries. Don't post verses, please. I'm going to block you. Okay? Pay attention, brother. Just don't help me. Just pay attention, brother. No, no, no. It's, give the guy a break. Give the guy a break. He's from South Africa. He's been uploading my videos and teaching people for the glory of Jesus Christ. But Truth for Life Ministries, don't post stuff because it's distracting. Just sit here, enjoy, and learn and receive. Okay. Let's go with the argument that the original reading of 1 Timothy 3.16 said he. The word has, because in the earlier Greek manuscripts, theos, theta sigma, looked like has, because, and I'll do a session on this. In the earliest Greek copies, the scribes had a tendency to abbreviate the names of God. So theos would be abbreviated, right? And so when you look at the earliest Greek copies, they're all capital letters, unseals, no spaces between words. Has and theos would look the same. So let's assume it originally said Haas and someone thought it was Theos. Okay, let's assume that. How do you explain, this is the question that James White, Daniel Wallace will never answer. At least never answer consistently, and I dare say honestly. They'll never answer. Listen to, to my challenge. Let's assume the word Haas was original. And then scribes confused Haas with Theos, the word God. Okay? How do you explain the fact that God allowed the King James translators to go with the word theos. So they translated 1 Timothy 16 as God was manifest in the flesh. And then this translation became the chief unrivaled translation for over 300 years with no rival. So that for over 300 years, millions of English speaking Christians in Europe and America read this as God was manifest in the flesh, a reading that Daniel Wallace and James White telling me is not original and yet God allowed this reading to be the reading and allowed his church to quote this as the reading and as a proof text for God appearing in the flesh, therefore bearing testimony that Jesus is the God man. And God did nothing to stop the church from being duped by a corrupt reading that's not original. See, that is what they never answer. Are you with me there? That's what they will never answer because they don't have an answer and they can't answer consistently or honestly. So they tap dance around the answer. These were the questions that ate me up because at one time I looked to Daniel Wallace, James White as authorities. But right now I'm not denigrating them. Daniel Wallace is brilliant in many ways, but because he follows the party line, he also spreads a lot of half-truths and misinformation because he's following the party line. Okay? So this is why I believe in the goodness and faithfulness of God and guiding the church in such a way to choose those manuscripts that he wanted them to translate from, those versions that he wanted to translate from, to include only those readings that he wanted to be there, producing the King James Bible to this day, a bestseller, even those who don't believe in Christianity will tell you it's one of the greatest works of English literature, one of the greatest English masterpieces ever produced. It's prose, it's poetry, it's cadence. God is definitely honored by the King James, definitely has blessed the King James, has definitely back, backed up the King James. That's why I accept all of its readings, 
whether there's manuscript support or not, the fact that God has honored it is good enough for me to believe by faith that those readings must have been there in the earliest witnesses and must have been what the original authors wrote down by inspiration. Otherwise, God would make sure it wouldn't form part of the Bible that's become the king of all English translations. That's my belief. That's my conviction, and I stand on it. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The triumph God lives. And the Bible he is preserved perfectly. And the Bible is the voice of the triumph God. And it's miraculous, divine in origin, perfectly preserved for the church and a dying world to know the God who exists and who loves them and is provided for their salvation in the person of Jesus Christ and by the blood of his cross. And he will return physically, bodily to judge the living and the dead. Modern author. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Pray for me, my daughters, that the Lord Jesus will keep them safe, keep me safe, set me free from all these restrictions, from a corrupt legal system, set me free from it, provide for the ministry, and give me the holiness, and the, the, my daughters the holiness to delight his heart, and that the Lord Jesus will bring them to me sooner than later, so I can raise them in the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you. I love you guys. Lord willing, see you. 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on David Wood's channel with Apostate Prophet. Take care.